Hey everyone, welcome to Signal Processing with Paul. And what I want to do in this video is talk a little bit about complex, i.e. imaginary numbers. Now, sometimes people call them imaginary numbers. We try to say complex, but uh, you'll still hear the word imaginary thrown around. And what I want to do is not only explain what they are and how to use them, but why they're so important and why they're so awesome and cool and important in electrical engineering and signal processing. So let's go ahead and get started. So if you're familiar with the number line, which I'm hoping you are, you're going to be familiar with the number line, here's zero, going in the positive direction, one, two, and three, and also going in the negative direction. So going to the left, minus one, minus two, and minus three. If you've ever stared at this number line, maybe what you've thought is, well, this is kind of boring. Can I go up? This is exactly what complex numbers allow you to do. We're going to take our number line and we're actually going to extend this in an entirely new dimension. This is going to be called what we have before. This is going to be called the real dimension. And this new dimension that I have is going to be called the imaginary dimension. Now, why would we care about this? Well, sometimes we want to represent numbers in two dimensional space. But of course, if that's what you're thinking, you're going to be like, why don't I just represent numbers in two, in, as basically x, y pairs in Cartesian space? And that's really a good point. But there are other ways in which you can represent complex numbers that are really important that will help us explain why the heck the square root of minus one pops up in here. So let's think about it. When I write a number here in complex space, so let's just say I have this number, and this is a terrible color, but I have this number here. And usually what we do is we use the letter Z to represent a number in complex space. What we say is Z equals two in the real direction plus one in the imaginary direction. And what we do is we put a J here, which this is implicitly, by the way, the square root of minus one. Some people use I, but double E's we use J and we, we like to use it and we, we try to force this on everyone else. So if you see a paper that uses J as a square root of minus one, there's a good chance it's a double E person, or they represent the I triple E in some particular way. So anyway, we can define a complex or an imaginary number as basically, in general, A plus B J, where A corresponds to the real part of the here. So this is real. This is the real direction. And this B term corresponds to the imaginary part. And as a result, we can create operators on Z. So we can say the real part of Z, of any complex number Z, is just equal to A, and the imaginary part of Z is equal to B. Pretty cool, but once again, this is just the same as writing this as, you know, in Cartesian coordinates, A comma B. So why do we do this? Why do we introduce the square root of minus one? The answer here has to do with one of the greatest mathematicians of all time, which is Euler. And Euler came up with a very, very interesting expression. Basically, what Euler, what Euler told us is that e to the j theta is equal to cosine of theta plus j sine of theta. Now, what the heck does this mean and how does this help us? Well, actually, if you look here, um, what's going on here is while we can represent this as basically <laughs> some number in the real direction and some number in the, in the imaginary direction, we can also represent this in terms of two other numbers. And the way we do this is we start by introducing some new angle. We call this angle theta. And rather than specify this point as two comma one, I can say, go out a distance r, so I'm gonna call this r, and then rotate this vector, so maybe you'd have to overshoot it here, and then rotate this vector from the origin a distance theta to get to where you want to go. And this is what Euler's function captures. It captures the relationship between going a certain distance and rotating your vector. So if I wanted, let's say I have this point in terms of A and B, and I want to find the angle of rotation, which is gonna be theta, and the radius, we call R radius, which is the length of this. 
how would we do this? Well, if you look at what we have, we actually have a right triangle and we can use our standard trigonometry and Pythagorean's theorem to actually find this. So if we wanna go from here in Cartesian form into polar form and the polar form of a, so this is Cartesian, the polar form of a complex number is equal to r e to the j theta, where theta angle and r is going to be your radius equals, often you write it like this, or the magnitude. So how do we do this? Well, if we look here at our right triangle, if we have a and b, then this pretty clear by the Pythagorean theorem that C is just going to be the square root of A squared plus B squared. So what we're gonna do is say the magnitude of Z is equal to square root of A squared plus B squared. Pretty simple. And if we look here at our angle, to get this angle, one thing we can do is we want to use, if you remember Sokotoa, the tangent. So the tangent of theta is equal to the opposite over the adjacent. So this is going to equal B over A. So if I want to get theta, theta is just going to equal the arctangent or tan inverse of B over A. That's how you can get your angle. So this is how you move from something in Cartesian to polar. You basically say square root of a squared plus b squared times e to the j tan inverse or arctangent of b over a. Pretty simple. Now let's say I give you a number in polar form. I give you r e to the j theta. How do I go from here back into Cartesian form? And this is where Euler's formula is going to help us. If you notice here, this cosine part is simply the real part. This is the part that doesn't have the j in front of it. Whereas the sine part, this tells us basically the imaginary part. So all we need to do is just multiply through by r. And what we have here is r cosine of theta plus j times r sine of theta. In other words, if we have a, a complex number z in this form, what we can do is say, Oops. The real part of Z is simply equal to R cosine of theta, and the imaginary part of Z is just equal to R sine of theta. Notice how we leave out the J because we basically are going to be assuming that we have real numbers, not complex numbers. The real and the imaginary operators simply just return a real number. So, you know, Z is equal to the real part of z plus j times the imaginary part of z. It's a little confusing, right? Because the imaginary returns a real number, so you multiply by j. But this, once again, is what you need to have. So hopefully this gives you a good overview of how complex numbers work and why we care about them. Once again, a good way to think about them is just extending the number line in more dimensions, but we're doing this in a way where we can write it either in a form of a plus bj, or we can write it in polar form. And this helps us because sometimes it's easier when we're multiplying these numbers to simply use it in polar form. Whereas other times when we're adding numbers, it'll help, it's much easier to just say, add the two numbers together. Because of course you, you add two complex numbers together, you say, you know, z1 plus z2, it's much easier to do this in Cartesian form than in polar form. So anyway, hope you found this video helpful. In the next video, what we'll do is we will look at adding and multiplying complex numbers.